All right, praise the Lord. Oh my goodness, I'm telling you, you guys just whoo, bless us so much. I'm serious. I'm thinking, good night. And how, how high can John sing? That's what I want to know. Mm. Man, John, that was good night. Whoo! And when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hand lifted high. That's about how high I can sing it. Oh, God. About two octaves down from where John was. <laughs> about that. All right, good, good. All right, so everybody that picked up an outline already knows what I'm going to share today. And you guys, many of our guys that, that, are, that are online, they get their outlines in advance, so they'll have them, uh, obviously, uh, when we do our service. And uh, I just wondered how they might have reacted when they got the outline for today. Because, uh, you know, we're in a series called Three Steps to Victory. And in, the, in this Three Steps to Victory, it, it tells us that we're in a battle. And of course, that's not news to anybody. We all know this, that we're in a battle. And obviously, it's getting worse and worse all the time. And in order to have victory in this battle, we're going to have to use the tools and the weapons that God gives us to use. And, and, and I've proposed to you three weapons that God has. They're very simple. They're not complicated in any way. But I believe that they are very powerful weapons and, and they have their distinct uses. And the first one, you might remember, the first message, I encourage you to stop believing lies because that's, the, that's one of the assaults that the enemy does all the time. Uh, like, the, like the song Justin sang this morning about, you know, shame. Uh, sh you're not welcomed. Leave your shame at the door. You're not, it's not welcomed anymore. Well, shame is a lie. And it's a lie that is used very effectively to, 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 to produce guilt and uh, depression and all, anxieties, all kinds of issues. And that's not what God says about you. That's what the enemy says about you. So the first tool, first step toward victory is stop believing lies. Last week, I gave you the second tool, which was keep believing the truth. And in order to keep believing the truth, you have to stay in the word because it's the word that's the truth. And, um, and we talked about the soul and the spirit being in conflict with each other and why it was so difficult to fight this battle and why it all, you had to fight it at all times because your soul has been alive since you were conceived and, uh, and your spirit has come in as the new kid on the block when you got saved and it's just a conflict going on there. So you have to stay in the word so that that word can graft itself to you so that it can save your soul, so that it can change your soul, make Make it, make it compatible and, and cooperate with the Spirit because it's totally necessary for this. And we spend way more time in anything else except the Word. You know, it, it's amazing how little time actually we do spend in the Word. If you put a time limit on it every day, you know, don't answer out loud obviously, but just think, all right, how much time do I actually spend in a day feeding my Spirit? And then how much do I spend feeding my soul? Uh, you'll see a great name fighting a chihuahua, really. All right. Now, here's the third one. And the third step to victory is start going to church. Now, this is how I wondered how people reacted that watch online because it, that seems like an assault on the fact that some people don't come to church that they might watch online or whatever it might be. And, and that is not my object whatsoever. Uh, we have lots of tools today that are wonderful. Part of those tools are the ability to be somewhere else and to see what's happening here because it blesses your heart and God leads you to that and you like to hear it and it, and it, 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 uh, it helps you, it trains you, it teaches you, it encourages you. It, God uses it to speak to you. So I'm certainly not trying to make people who watch online or if you guys, I know some of you guys, sometimes you can't make it to church. Uh, lots of things happen in our lives that make it hard or impossible to be here. And that's why we went to all the expense and all the trouble and we have people in the media room manning all this stuff and cameras and all the sound and everything because we want to give you an opportunity for that. So I, I don't want to deal so much with the word start going to church. 
I, I, I want to deal with the, like the word going, ba basically. Like, what does, when I go to church, what, what difference does it make? I mean, do, should I go to church in person as often as I possibly can? I mean, does it, is it worth all of the effort and all of the trouble to get up and get dressed and make myself look presentable and actually get in an automobile, come down, sit in a service? I mean, is, it, is, it, is there value to that? Do, is that what we, we need to do? And um, I'm going to say yes, and I have three reasons why, and I know that doesn't surprise you. It seems like all my messages have three of something. You know, three, three means it's from God. That's all, you know, body soul, spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. A everything that's from God is in threes. And so you just get these threes all the time. But I'll give you three reasons. And when I, was, when I said that, I just it reminded me of a, a little deal I heard. I've heard it many years. And uh, it's, about a, it's about a man who wakes up on Sunday morning and says, I'm not going to church. Tells his wife, I'm not going to church today. And I'm going to give you three good reasons why. And he said, number one, I don't like the building. I never have liked the building. It just, the, the actual structure just offends me. Number two, I don't like the people. The people that are there, I just don't care about. I don't, I don't like them. And number three, I don't think they like me because they look at me funny and, you know, you can just tell they just really don't like me. So I'm not going to church today. And she said, well, all right, let me tell you three good reasons why you are going to church. Number one, I've gotten up and gotten dressed and I'm going. Number two, the children have gotten up, they've gotten dressed and they're going. And number three, you're the pastor and they're expecting, <laughs> they're expecting you to be there. <laughs> well, anyway, all right, here we go, here we go. Three reasons to go to church. Number one, God's presence. When you go to church, you experience God's presence. Now, I know that God's presence is everywhere. We know that one of the characteristics of God that makes him God is that he is omnipresent, which means he is everywhere all at the same time. You can't go a place where the presence of God is not there. Second kind of presence is there is an inner presence. The inner presence of God is when the Holy Spirit comes and inhabits your life when you trust Christ. Now, what I want to deal with today is what I'm going to call, I'm going to label because I don't have a better word for it. I'm going to call it the manifest presence of God. The manifest presence of God is that presence that we sense when we come together in his name and he shows up in, in the midst of us. It's, it's, that, it's that sense of God. It's, that, it's that, uh, that, that feel within us that somehow uh, God has just entered the room and that he is actually here with us. And I know any of you that have ever been in any spiritual service anywhere at any time, you have experienced what I'm talking about. You just sense that God is just there. Like, a matter of fact, uh, several times this morning in the worship, I, I, I'm, see, I'm over here by myself, and man, I, I'm, I sense the presence of God. I mean, when I hear those, some of those words and some of the things, and it just, it's just like God's presence is right there with us. Well, that's, that's what I'm talking about, the manifest presence of God. The first place that was built for God to actually come to, to commune and to be in the presence of men is a place in the Old Testament, and when I say the word, I know you've heard it before, it's called the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent, a gigantic tent that was built in some very specific ways that traveled with Israel when they crossed the desert. And in that tent was a place called the Holy of Holies. And the Ark of the Covenant was there and the mercy seat was there. And that's where God met with the high priest of Israel and spoke and actually, uh, they actually came together only one time a year. L let, me, let me read this to you. And this is in um, Exodus 25, verse eight and nine. And let them, this is God speaking, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. In other words, a, a place for God to live with them. That's what he's talking about. That I can be there with them, God says. Get me a place ready. According to all that I show you, 
That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings. Just so you shall make it. So God is saying this thing is, has to be built in a very special way, in a unique way, and I'm going to show you how to, what I want it to look like and how I want it to be, and you build it just like I say. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, that this tabernacle is a pattern of heavenly things. That it's a, in other words, there's a temple in heaven, and the tabernacle on earth is built according to how the temple in heaven was. And so God is saying, you build me a place, and I'll, and I'll, I'll come and visit with you. So obviously... God says there's a purpose. I want to be in your presence and I want you in my presence. So build me a place. So obviously when we come together, God's presence is there. Now Jesus actually confirms this idea in Matthew 18. Here's what he says. I know you'll remember this verse very well. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So when we get together in his name, Jesus says that his very presence is there. And we've obviously experienced that, and we do experience it all the time. So the presence of God is, is always a, a vital thing for the people of God. Now, let me, let me share with you something that happened between God and Israel that I'm not sure whether you've read this before or know anything about this, but this is in uh, Genesis 33. And what happens is when God goes, when Moses goes up on the mountain to get the commandments from God, God's up there, God writes the commandments and so forth and gives them to Moses to take back down to the children of Israel. And while God, Moses is on the mountain, the children of Israel are building a golden calf and dancing around the golden and calf. So God looks at Moses and God says, you better get down there because those people that you're leading are going crazy. You better get down there and do something about it. And then Moses goes down and, and, and God is so angry about this that he looks at Moses and he says, Moses, he said, um, I'm going to take you guys to the promised land because I promised it, but I'm not going in there with you. I'm going to just send an angel in and let that angel just take care of all the enemies and so forth, I, but I, I, I'm not going in with you. Well, as a matter of fact, let, let me just read it. Genesis 33. Then the Lord said to Moses, depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, your descendants I will give it, and I will send my angel before you and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite and the Termite and the, you know. That works every time, doesn't it? I do that every time. Works every time. All right, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst lest I consume you on the way for you are a stiff-necked people. In other words, God said, look, I don't think that I could stand to be in your presence long enough to go up there with you because you guys are so um, reckless and you're so unappreciative that I think I'd probably have to kill you on the way because you, you, are, you are so stiff-necked, so ignorant. Now, Moses then goes outside the camp of Israel and he pitches a tent and he called it the tent of meeting. And in this tent of meeting, he went out there alone and met with God and talked with God about this situation. Now, Joshua came out there later, but Mo, it was primarily Moses all by himself in this tent of meeting, and he was talking with God. And, and here's what he said to him in, in verse 13, same chapter, Genesis 33. Now, therefore, this is Moses talking to God. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I might find grace in your sight and, and consider that this nation is your people. He's saying, God, come on. You're not going to go with us? We're, we're your people. You've got to go. This is your people, God. And God said... My presence will go with you. All right, change my mind. And I'll give you rest. 
Then this is what I want you to see, what Moses says. Then he said to him, Moses says to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. If you're not coming, God, we're not going either. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. Do you, see, do you hear what Moses is saying to God? Moses is saying to God, if your presence is not with us, there is nothing different about us than all the other people in the world. The only thing that makes us different is that your presence is with us. And the same thing is true about church. The only thing that makes us any different from any other meeting of any other morally conscious, community-spirited people anywhere, the only thing that makes this meeting different than the Kiwanis Club or the Knights of Columbus or the Gideons or, or the Woodsmen of the World, which is an insurance company, I don't, they do flags and stuff. But anyway... That, you know, I, all through the years, I, I've had lots of uh, members of churches that I've pastored that are in all kind of community. The Kiwanis, you know, um, uh, uh, I was trying to think of one specific one, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Lions Club, that's what it was. Lions Club. Anyway, I get invited to these meetings, and let me tell you what I've experienced when I go to these meetings. When I go to these meetings, uh, many of them, when you, go, when you first walk in the door, someone greets you and says, hey, welcome to the meeting today. We're glad to have you. And then uh, you go and find you a seat, and when you find you a seat, uh, somebody hands you a bulletin, which is an order of what's happening today and what we're gonna be doing and what this is all about. And then you sit there, and, and before long, someone stands up there, and they say, all right, we're gonna sing, and many of these groups have their own hymnals. I mean, they're just hymnals, and they got them from some church somewhere. And they'll, you'll you, you sing a couple of hymns out of there, and then somebody will get up, and they'll make some announcements, and then somebody gets up and says, all right, we need to take an offering because this, this group stands for goodwill and good work and we want to help people, so here's the offering. And you put your money in the offering. And then somebody stands up and they'll read a couple of two or three Bible verses and they'll say some things about being moral or being good or you know belonging to a good organization. And then they say, if you want to join and be a part of our organization, just come right down here and sign up right now. And when I'm in that kind of <laughs> meeting, I'm thinking, that really just sounds real familiar to me. <laughs> you know? that, that's just like something else I know. Well, the only thing that makes us any different and makes this time any different is the presence of God is in this place. God is here. And I'm going to tell you something, the presence of God is so powerful, you would just be shocked at what it can overcome. Let me just give you one, I, I, I don't think I've ever talked about this at church, but let me, I'm going to talk about this because it's 30, over 35 years old, all right? So I'm not even sure anybody that was in it is still alive anymore. But, but Tanya and I experienced this. We were in a church. I was an associate pastor. And, uh, and our pastor got, I, I had gone to preach revival and I was already in the other city. And I opened the newspaper that Saturday morning. I was already like in, in, in Alabama somewhere uh, going to do a revival. And I opened up the paper and on the front page of the paper was our pastor lying face down on an airport runway with, with some uh, agents, uh, drug enforcement agents with a pistol pointing down at him, standing over him like this. He had gotten arrested for smuggling drugs and whatever. All right, so I fly back home immediately. I mean, I'm not playing, I just go fast. Back home. <laughs> and, <clears throat> you know, I'm 25 years old, something like that, and... <sighs> I've never been confronted with anything like this. And so the next morning, obviously, you've got all of the media from everywhere, ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, Fox News. You got all the local news channels and everything and all the cameras. You can't even walk up to the building. There's so many things like that. 
Because that was big news back then now. I'm, I mean, you know, we, we hadn't had all these scandals we've had, you know, and it was, that was still real big news for everybody back then. And so we, we wouldn't let them bring the cameras in the church. They could come if they wanted to, but we, we didn't want a three-ring circus going on in there. And so the, the people were there, and, and, and uh, the pastor uh, sent in, he wasn't there live, he sent in his resignation from the church. Well, I know that you probably are not aware of business procedures because we don't, we don't do any of them, but um, if, a, if a resignation is given, it has to be received by the church. It has to be accepted by the church. Church has to vote and say, okay, we will accept that resignation. If the church votes not to accept it, then he can, he can resign, but he's still the pastor, you know, because we didn't accept it. Well, he sent his rec- resignation and... Uh, and the church, you know, of course, I'm leading everything because I'm the associate pastor, and the church accepted it. And then a member from came up the aisle, a uh, gentleman, and and um, and and I kind of went over and I said, "Yes, sir, can I help you?" And he said, "Look, you said y'all are just going to throw this man away and blah blah." He was he's wanting to argue about it, and some of my men saw that I guess the look on my face and knew that was there was something going on. And they, a couple of them, came, couple, bouncers obviously, came over and said, Pastor, you have any, you have any trouble? And I said, well, you know, this gentleman just wants, you know, he's complaining about this. this, this. And they said to him, uh, come on out here in the hall and let's talk about it. And um, he didn't want to come out in the hall. <laughs> about seven men, I mean, just stood up, came up there, grabbed him, carried him, kicking, hollering, screaming out the door, but he went out. I don't know how many he thought it would take to get him out, but I know how many we were going to use, as many as we needed to. And they took him out and all that. He was in the military, by the way, and he got real, in real big trouble because the military frowns on such things as that, going out in public, making a spectacle of yourself like that. So anyway, the point is, it was, man, people were just crying. Kids were squealing because, you know, he's, he's kicking and fighting, trying to go out, and they're just ushering him right on out. They're packing him out, is what I call it. And, and the kids start crying and everything, and it's just like a, like a bomb got dropped in that building. And I stood up, and I, I, of course, obviously, I'm not going to preach a sermon. I mean, I didn't even really know what to do. And I just stood up there, and I looked out at them, and I said, look, I said, I'm not going to preach a sermon today. But I really believe that some of you are here today because God compelled you to be here. He drew you here so that you could trust him today. And no matter what's happened and all the other thing, God is still God, and you need him. And so Tanya started playing, you know, something on the piano, just some soft music, and we had seven or eight people come forward and receive Christ that day. No sermon, no big nothing, just a bomb got dropped in the sanctuary, and seven or eight people came forward and gave their life to Christ that day. That is the power of God. Of God. Only God can do things like that. So one of the reasons we need to go to church is to experience the presence of God among his people that are gathered in his name. Not that you can't experience it anywhere else, but it's not the same. Number two, here's the second reason, God's power. We read Matthew 18 just a moment ago where Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Let's look back at the verse before that, verse 19. Here's verse 19. Again, I say to you, this is Jesus, that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, It will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of this. Now the word for, which is the word that begins verse 20, and I don't want to make a big deal out of this. Um, You know, I don't want to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel up here. But I, I just want to mention to you that what Jesus is saying here is something we miss most of the time. 
the word, verse 24, where two or three are gathered in my name, four is a preposition. It means because. So Jesus is literally saying to us, he's saying, all right, again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven because where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. In other words, I, I don't think I'm misunderstanding Jesus, and if you think that I'm, I'm missing this, you tell me. I think what Jesus is saying here is the reason that two of us can ask for anything, of course the implication is in his name, which means his purpose and, and who he is. I mean, you, not a gold Cadillac, you know, not a bass boat, something like that. Ask anything according to his purpose, yeah. according to who, who he is and what he wills, if you want to look at it that way. The reason we can do that and his father will do it is because he's standing right in the midst of us. And if his presence is in the midst of us, then his power is in the midst of us. And so the reason we can get our prayers answered like that is because Jesus is standing right there with us. So many people, so, so many people need the power of God in their life. So many people want the power of God in their life, but, they, but, but, but you wouldn't catch them dead in a church. And that's where, that's where it is. You're gathered in my name. Now look, you don't have to be in some big cathedral somewhere with a thousand people in it. You don't even have to be in a church our size with a you know, hundred people in it or whatever it might be. You know, two or three, he said, are gathered in my name. Now, that's the important issue right there. Look, I know some people say, well, yeah, well, me and my buddy and me and a couple of my buddies are going fishing, so they're going to be in the present. No, 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 because you're not meeting in his name. You're meeting to fish. And you, he's just accident, you know. I mean, you, you know, he's, you, no, no, he ain't there. No, uh -uh, you, it's not the same. But, but the, my point is, it could be four or five people. It could be two or three people. It doesn't have to be in some sanctuary somewhere in order to be meeting in his name. But it does have to be a concerted effort to, to seek him and to seek his purpose and to seek him. When I grew up in the ancient days, we went to church at least three times a week. I mean minimum three times a week. Sunday morning, all right, can somebody finish that for me? Sunday night, Wednesday night. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And that was um, if we didn't have Tuesday night visitation, uh, Saturday morning prayer breakfast, or a teaching during the week, uh, one of the weeknights, like Thursday night. Sunday morning, we, we even had a little saying about it. It was so, so, uh, so there every week. I'm talking about every week now. It was there. And we said this. This is what we used to say about it. If you come to church only on Sunday morning, it means you love the church. If you come to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night, it means you love the pastor. If you come all three times, it means you love the Lord. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we swung the guilt hammer. We sure did. How do you think we got people there three times? <laughs> we, <laughs> we just guilted them <laughs> right there. Now look, I'm not advocating that. I'm not, a, this is a different day. I'm not advocating that we meet three times a week or five times a week or whatever. I don't even know. I'm thinking, I'm thinking now, how did we do that? You know, Justin did, did it. Uh, he was part of that generation. And we, only, we not only went to church, we went to Sunday school, church, training union, which was a Sunday night teaching meeting time, church, Wednesday night, Wednesday night was RAs and GAs and ACT teams and youth group and choir practice and church. That was our life. So I'm not advocating that we go back to a schedule like that. I'm just saying that we need to get together as often as possible with other believers. Why? Because I know what happens 
when we get together with other believers. Let me read what King David said about it in Psalms 92, just quickly for you. Here's what David, here's how David describes what happens when you're planted in the house of God, all right? All right, so you're not flitting out on the edges somewhere. You're not out there in the, you know, just coming in every once in a while to see what's happening. And you, you know, mama said come, and so you got to come. So I'm talking about you plant, you're, you're planted in the house of God. This is what David says happens. He's talking, in this whole chapter, he's talking about the Sabbath day. And if you treat it right, how, how it's going to bless your life. This is Psalm 92, verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Don't you just love that line? Those that are planted in the house of God shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. That word fresh, this is interesting. I just, the word flourishing means green and the word fresh means full of sap. It, I, I interpret it as fat, you know, all right. So though when you're old, you'll, you'll still, you'll be fat and green, you know. You, you, won't, you won't be wilted on the vine. All right, so we should go to church because of God's presence and because of God's power. And here's the third reason, God's people. You may be thinking, well, I have God's power and I have God's presence. Why in the world would I need God's people? Well, just to sum it up for you, God's presence and his power flow through his people. How does God get to you? How does God work in you? How does God provide for you? Does he land on your windowsill and speak to you through the pain, you know? Well, does he talk out of a cloud? Yeah, how does God affect your life? His presence and his power come through his people. There was a song written, and I don't know if any of you, yeah, some of you are old enough, but I don't know if you were tuned into country music back then. There's a country artist called Tom T. Hall. Any of you guys remember Tom T. Hall? Remember the year Clayton Delaney died? That, that's Tom T. Hall. Yeah. 1972, Tom T. Hall wrote a song that expresses the way many people feel about their spiritual life. And, it, and, and the chorus explains it all. It's, here, here it is. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. We don't need anybody to tell us what it's all about. Well, the only thing wrong with that is that's not the way God set it up. God didn't set it up to be you and Jesus and, and nobody else. God set it up. As a matter of fact, the only thing that was not good on the, in creation, according to God, was that man was created alone. Whenever first day he creates, you know, he separates earth, water, darkness, light. Uh, it was good. Behold, it was good. 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 It was very good. And then he looks at man alone and he said, that is not good. And so God looks at Adam and says, you know, I think I can do better than that. Um, which he creates moms, by the way. That's just, I threw that in for you moms. So, so he creates, that's right, so he creates a mate for Adam so that Adam won't be alone. God does not intend for us to be alone. To be alone is a terrible thing for every part of our life, psyche, our mentality, our personality, our lives, everything. God does not intend for that, and he doesn't intend for it to be just you and him. I think, you know what I think? I think we underestimate what it means to be the people of God. To be God's people. That God says, you're my people. That is an amazing thing. You know, uh, the Jews understand what it means to be God's people because they were the original God's people. Maybe we don't understand it so much because we're, we weren't part of the original God's people. We are Gentiles and we got grafted in because of Jesus. 
So we, we got brought in to the people of God because of, uh, of God's purpose and that the Jews really rejected him. And so now we're part, we are God's people because uh, God put us there. Now let me read you a, cu- a couple of verses here, a few verses, three or four, about what this means and what, what the Apostle Paul and what Peter and what Jesus had to say about this, all right? Here's Peter. Peter's talking to us now. This is written to us. Listen to this. First Peter 2, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Man, that's good. You, he, he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's just such a phrase. And now you who had not obtained mercy have obtained mercy. You who weren't the people of God are now the people of God. What does it mean to be the people of God? Ask Israel. Man, a tiny little dot over there in the middle of hatred everywhere. Nobody even wants to uh, let them stay alive, much less. And look how blessed they are. Look how powerful they are. What does it mean to be the people of God? You are blessed and you are powerful. God protects you and God blesses you. This is what it means to be the people of God. We don't respect that enough, I don't think. Number Here's, here's what Paul says in Romans 9. Even us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he says also in Hosea, that's the Old Testament prophet, Hosea. By the way, that's in chapter 2, verse 23, if you want to read it sometime, what he's about to quote. I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who, who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they shall be called sons of the living God. It's good to be a part of the people of God. Man, and we need each other. And this is why we need to be at church, because we need each other. God has put us together. Uh, Look, all right, let me get this as Jesus. And we miss this too. We, we, we know this verb, these verses by heart. We know what they're all about, except we don't know. We don't get it right. I'm gonna help, I'm gonna see if I can help us. All right, Matthew 22, here's what happened. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, the Sadducees, these are two religious groups. You know, the Pharisees and then the Sadducees. The difference was the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. That's why they were sad, you see. (laughs) This remember. And and when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Oh, look, don't ever try to get smart with Jesus. Just, just hang it up. You, you know, you, you're dealing with superior uh, mind here. This lawyer thinks he's got him because whichever commandment he says is going to be wrong. There are 10 of them, by the way. You do remember this, right? So he says, all right, which one is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. That little phrase, like it, it means the second is together with it. It's the same. It's the same. So what he's saying is, all right, the first commandment, love God, all your heart, soul, mind. The second one is connected to it, they're twins, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all of the law and prophets. Now, and I'm gonna just remind you that that's all they had when Jesus said this. 
There was no New Testament when Jesus said this. They were living the New Testament. There was only the law and the prophets. There was only the Old Testament at that that time, and it was divided into two parts. The law are the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and the rest were the prophets, the minor prophets and the major prophets, and that's all they had. So what Jesus is saying here, and I don't think I'm taking this to an extreme, is that all of the Bible hangs on these two commandments. Everything the Bible is, everything it means, everything it desires, hangs on these two commandments. And what are these two commandments? Love God, love people. Let's just put it another way. Have a relationship with God and have a relationship with people. You need both of them. They said, Jesus said, it, they're, they're alike. They go together. You can't have one without the other. You need both. So why do we need God's people? Well, in the book of Corinthians, uh, any of you that have ever studied the book of Corinthians, the the church at Corinth was was uh, an active church. They loved the Lord. They they had a lot of enthusiasm. They had a lot of zeal for the Lord. The only thing they didn't have was much maturity. And, And they kept having problems all the time, all kinds of situations and stuff. And they had services going wild and they had the Lord's Supper being disrespected and they just, you know, they ate meat, sacrificed to idols and blah, blah. I mean, they just did all these kind of things. Well, the Apostle Paul was trying to give them a little bit of help. You know, he's trying to be beneficial to them and he says in chapter 14, verse 26, look at this. How, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. The word edification means building up. Building up. All right. Now, let me, let me, let me put this before you and, and don't reject it out of, out of hand because I, I think it's the truth. What Paul is saying to them is when you guys come together, you have a song and you have a psalm, and you have a teaching, and you have a revelation, and you have a tongue, and you got an interpretation back there, that all of us have different aspects of God's instruction, of God's visitation, of God's training. And it seems to me that what Paul is saying is, that in order to grow, you must receive something from God that has been given to someone else. We all have different gifts. We all have different different abilities. And it's like God looks at you and says, I'm going to give you what you need. I'm going to answer your question. I'm going to, that prayer you've been praying I got some teaching about that that I need to give you, but I'm going to use I'm going to use Ron to do it, or I'm going to you know I'm gonna, I'm uh, I'm going to use somebody else. I'm going to give it to Joe, and then I'm going to let Joe give it to you, so that we won't ever forget the fact that we need each other. God could show us anything He wanted any time he wanted, in any way he wanted. So why does he tell us that we need each other? Why does he not give any of us all of the gifts? Because he doesn't want us to be lone rangers. He doesn't want us to think that we can get along without each other. We're a body. Somebody's an eye, somebody's a hand, somebody's an elbow, somebody's a kneecap, somebody's a big toe, somebody, I mean, you know, then we won't even get into heart, lungs, livers, and all that kind of stuff. But we all have different functions, and the only way we make it is that we all make it together. God's people. That's why he calls us the assembly. That's, in the Old Testament, the, the nation of Israel were, were, was called many times the assembly. Have you, ever, have you guys ever heard of the signal trumpets? That, have you ever come across that word before? The signal trumpets? It's in the Bible. Well, you probably hadn't, but, so let me just read, read it to you. 
This is in Numbers 31, and the reason I'm going to Numbers 31 first is because it calls them the signal trumpets. Then I'll go back and show you what they're for. Numbers 31, verse six. Then Moses sent them to the war, 1,000 from each tribe. He sent them to the war with Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priest, with the holy articles and the signal trumpets in his hand. All right, so what are the signal trumpets? Numbers 10, this is when God told him to, to make them. Verse one, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work, metal hammered, beaten. You shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. Go down to verse nine. Between verse two that right there and nine, it just says, when you hear one blast, you march forward. When you hear two blasts, you blah, blah. All right, that's just instruction. You want to look down at verse nine. When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, anybody, anybody identify with that? You ever get oppressed by your enemy in your own land? It, it, okay, I don't guess so. All right. When you go to war in your land against the enemy who oppresses you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets and you will be remembered before the Lord your God and you will be saved from your enemies. So what are the purposes of the signal trumpets? Well, to call them together. And what have we learned about being called together? The reason we are called together, remember Paul told the Corinthians, do everything for edification. So the reason we're called together is so we can be built up. So what is the purpose of the signal trumpets? First, one, edification. And then he said, when you blow it, you're gonna give direction to the, to the camps. So for direction, and then you're gonna, you're gonna uh, bring the enemies out with another blast. So it's protection. So edification, direction, and protection, that's what the trumpets are used for. By the way, it's <laughs> three again. <laughs> just saying. Yeah, three, edification, direction, and protection. That's three, you just can't get away from it. And by the way, I heard, we, uh, I've pastored many years and I've had many uh, young men and women that have, volu not volunteered, but have answered the call to the ministry. And when you do, many times you'll go to Bible college and seminary and stuff like that. Well, if you go to seminary, they have a, at least one class on the foundations of preaching, you know, where they teach you how to preach is what it boils down to. And one, one of my students said one time, I thought it was just clever as could be. One of my students one time said, they asked the professor in this class, how many points should a good sermon have? And the professor said, at least one. I thought, I thought that, he said, you should never preach a pointless sermon. <laughs> I thought this was good. But anyway, all right. Yeah, yeah. Why we come to church? Because we need to be edified. We need to be built up. We need to have direction in our life. And we need to be protected from our enemy. You know, you, you know who the enemy gets first, right? The, who the lion catches first? The one on the outside. The one out there on the fringe, the one out there twiddling around, following the butterflies and not serious about anything. And they don't study anything. They don't read anything. They don't come to church. They don't try to participate. They just kind of meander in and out when it feels good to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're sheep, by the way. The Bible calls us sheep. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. So if you're on the fringe, if you're out there on the edge, here's what you need to do. Excuse me, 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 excuse me. Work your way to the middle. Because those out there on the end, they're going to be the first ones that get attacked by the enemy. You need to get into the middle and get the people of God around you and stay in the middle just as tight as possible and be gathered with God's people. Now, I know that what I'm about to say probably won't make a bit of difference, but I do want you to see this because I think it's kind of neat, really. There's a difference between a gathering and an assembly, 
right? I mean, have you ever thought about that? That God just doesn't tell us to gather together. He says, assemble. And we're, and we're called the assembly. Uh, so what's the difference between just simply being gathered and being assembled? Well, let me illustrate it this way. Well, suppose I said to you, I want you to come over to my house and I want to show you my new truck. And you came over to the house and I raised the garage door and you, when you looked in there, you saw four tires over here, steering wheel over there, transmission, engine, uh, you know, all kinds of parts all in that garage. What would be your first question? Uh, you, know that, you know that's not assembled, don't you? Yeah, but I got all the parts. They're all gathered together in one place. So they're gathered, yeah, but you can't drive it that way. You, you know that, right? <laughs> It has to, be, has to be assembled. That's right. So to be gathered just means to be in one place. You can be gathered with people who don't even think like you, who don't even know you, who don't like you, or wouldn't like you if they knew what you believed. You could be gathered with all kinds of people, but you can only be assembled with like-minded individuals that have a like-minded purpose who have a direction to go because that's what assembled means. It means that you are not only together, but that you have been put together in such a way because there is a purpose for you. I mean, look, look like Bricks, Billy and I, Billy and I have, uh, put, the, put this passage on, on the screen because I just put it in there so you could see it, the assembly. This is number 10, verse 7, then I'm moving on. And when the assembly is to be gathered together, you shall blow the trumpet, but not sound the advance. See, they just called them the assembly. I won't just say it. All right. So let's, let's look at it this way. You have a pile of bricks. If you have a pile of bricks, all those bricks are gathered. They're all in one pile. Now, each individual brick has its own value. Uh, what is it worth, 50 or 60 cents a brick, something like that? Maybe more, depending on what kind of brick it is and so forth. But it has its own individual value. It has its own individual beauty because it's nicely colored and it's shaped and it has its own beauty by itself. And uh, it has its own strength. I mean, you can hit somebody over the head with it and it'll really be bad. It's strong, so it has its own strength. So when a, in a pile of brick that are gathered, they have, each brick has its own identity, its own value, its own beauty, and its own strength. But when you assemble those bricks together for a purpose, you have now greatly increased their, their value. Because now, they're not just one little individual brick that has one little value. Now they have been assembled for a purpose and they are a home or they are a wall or they are a chimney or they are a patio. They, and they're far more valuable when they're assembled together. What I'm saying is God, won't, God has called us to assemble with God's people because we have a purpose. We, we, he doesn't just drag us in and we're all separate. No, we're all in union with each other because God has called us together for a purpose. You wonder why, why do you go to Freedom River? Why don't you go to First Baptist? Why don't you go to uh, Cornerstone? Why don't you go to you know, any uh, First Baptist Long Beach? I mean, why, why do you come here? Because God has called you here. Because this is where he wants you. Because we need you. We need your gift. We need you. You're part of the assembly, you know? Without you, we're, we're not complete. And God does that with his people everywhere. And that's why he says this, and this is the last thing I want to say to you. I just want to put it up on the screen. This is Hebrews 10. Look at what it says. Let me read it for you. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the matter, manner of some, but exhorting one another, 
and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Yeah, so we shouldn't be meeting less. We should be meeting more. We should be getting together more as we see the day approaching. And the day is certainly approaching. I'm gonna tell you that the day is on the horizon. All right, bow your head with me.